now. Well, this is near and dear to my heart and the work I've done at the Road to Ruta. And Route A, the name Ruta stands for Route A, which is a computer term. It's the base uh, computer terminology for the financial system that was invented in the 1960s when they invented electronic assets. And I've gone through, you know, those who have followed my work, I've gone through where electronic assets came from, who was in charge. Alan Greenspan is the guy who invented it. His buddy, Chon Kemeny, invented basic computing. And then, you know, the, the recent revelations that we're being spied on and there's embedded uh, malware and software in every electronic device. You know, we've been hearing about that for years and years, but it really would, never came into the consciousness that uh, your government or people within the embedded deep state of the CIA uh, can and do watch you, listen to you, um, can interrupt your operation of your car if they choose to do so and can take you out with a click of a mouse. Um, it's very frightening to people, but a lot of people, you know, just goes right over their heads and says, well, you know, oh, of course they spy on us, it's big brother. But the invasiveness that that these, this uh, WikiLeaks um, stuff coming out, I, I think the real interesting thing about this, and I was talking to Cliff High about it, is that it's not only the information about what companies were involved and how it works. It's the code. It's the actual computer code that they embedded, which gives anybody who wants to counter that the ability and tools to do that. So I, when I originally saw it, I'm, I'm like, oh, we are absolutely screwed. Every single thing from our television to our laptop to our phone to our car, you know, to our coffee machine that's, that's computer um, controlled is watching us and can be altered and changed. But because we all have the code now and it is public knowledge, uh, countermeasures can be taken. And, and there are already people starting to counter what was already embedded in these devices. Now it's going to change humanity greatly, um, knowing that, that everything you do is no longer secret and it will take years to either get new devices or put patches on so that the government uh, is blocked from their invasive taxes. But also, you know, we've got different people in charge now. And will the tr people behind Trump stand up and, and take these people out within the CIA? And now it is obvious. The wiretapping announcement that <laughs> Trump made um, couldn't have been timed better right before the release of facts and documents and the code uh, that we are all wiretapped. So Trump was absolutely 100% right when he said Obama was wiretapping him because we are all wiretapped, and that is what has just come out, and, and the mainstream media is blocking it still, but the ramifications of this are huge. And you, you would think, we discussed this uh, prior to the uh, interview, that people should be very angry about this, that, you know, in your house, in the privacy of your home, in the privacy of your car, they're watching you, they're listening to you. Wouldn't you think that you, you would see protests and people out in the streets marching saying this is not allowed because it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. It's actually a violation of the Fifth Amendment where they're using your personal property without compensation. You know, we didn't give them permission to use our devices. Wouldn't you think that people would be out there protesting? Well, if it was Trump that had initiated it and started it and was out there doing it, yeah, you'd see the left out there protesting. Uh, the problem is it, it looks like, yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's all Obama. Definitely Obama took it to a, a different level in the evasiveness and going around, you know, they're talking about uh, did Obama go in and get a FISA uh, court order to do a tap on Trump? It's, it, this is completely outside of FISA. This is not even going through the legal channels. This is completely criminal behavior. Um, but the distraction is there of, you know, Trump is the bad guy for the left, and they're running it on the news every day. So the battles continue. Um, and it, it's, it'll be difficult to take out the embedded bad guys, as I call them, the deep state, uh, the part of the deep state that is not on board with changing the way the world works. That, you know, those are the guys who won the battle, the people who want to change America back to something that we understand. So, yeah, it, it, it is great that it's being, uh, released and it's out in the open now. Um, hopefully more and more people will open their eyes and stop listening to the mainstream media it's it's difficult because the the bad guys in the deep state is is fighting the alt media trying to um basically silence them with 
computer algorithms written by Google and YouTube and Twitter to stop the message from spreading. And it's, it's, it's a battle. It's a real battle going on, and uh, we're, we're living through it. When you talk about the uh, wiretapping um, with Trump, I mean, I saw two things happen. Yes, you know, he's showing that they were wiretapping, but the entire corporate media had um, Trump and Sessions, you know, colluding with Russia. As soon as he came out with the wiretapping, like that news was like knocked off and the whole wiretapping news was on there because they were defending Obama, saying, no, he didn't do this. So he had really actually two agendas with this. One kind of like uh, wag the dog distraction, but actually showing that, yes, they are spying on me. Do you think he actually has proof of this? Well, we have we have proof in the WikiLeaks documents. I mean, there's proof right there that, yes, uh, he's spying on when, Obama. When I, I mean, when I Trump. Proof, when I say proof, I mean, it, it sounds like they're asking for documentation like the FISA documentation that Obama ordered it well that would be legal spying and whether or not you know supposedly there is the first we, we do know that the uh, the interesting thing is we know that Obama tried to get a Pfizer request done in June and they wouldn't let him have it it's very rare that a Pfizer request is, is shut down but this one was shut down and then apparently he went for another one in um, October uh, yes, I do believe there is one. I, I believe that uh, that that was there. They were going to say, well, you know, these other people within the Trump campaign are talking to the Russians about. Basically, I believe they were talking to the Russians because you know the Russia was knee deep in taking down these bad guys as well. This has been a group effort. It's just not a, a small part of the United States, you know, Secret Service or anything like that. This is a group global effort to take down the criminality within the U.S. government, within the European government. This is this is a global thing. And, yes, they were coordinating with Russia. Putin is on the side of the good guys. Trump and the people he works with is on the side of the good guys. So, of course, they were colluding because you, you can't just be one guy, Trump, saying, oh, I'm going to take out the bad guys. They'd, they'd make you disappear in a blink of an eye. Um, so, yeah, but they – so they got a – they probably got uh, the FISA uh, approval and they probably were legally tapping Trump's phones, but they, you know, <laughs> who is it that's tapping the phones? These are the criminals that are being removed, and um, it'll be really interesting when that comes out. They're going to say, oh, well, you know, they, they got a FISA approval because Trump was colluding with the Russians. That's the, the big uh, meme that the, the left and the, um, the deep state that are entrenched are trying to play because it's true. They were colluding with the Russians, but it's to take out the criminals. It's to take out the criminals within the United States and around the world. It did take a, a uh, kind of a agreement between some very large nations to make this happen, and, and it's currently ongoing. I just wanted to change subjects right now to what Trump did in the Oval Office, and I, and I want to get your take on what you think this means. He took a portrait of Andrew Jackson and hung it on the wall inside the Oval Office. You can actually see it behind him. Why do you think he took the portrait of Andrew Jackson and hung it on the wall? It, it was a sign. It was a symbol of what's about to happen to the banking system. We all know Andrew Jackson was very much anti-banks. He's the guy who fought the banks and well-known for it. Um, you know, Obama administration is trying to take him off the, was it the $20 bill? That's correct. And, yes. and that ain't going to happen. We, there's a new ruler in town, a new sheriff in town. Um, but that's not the only thing he did. He also changed the curtains in the Oval Office. Uh, I think they were red before, but now they are gold. And what do you think that means? That, that means we're going back to some form of a gold standard, which is exactly what is foretold in the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston's, uh, the Road to Ruta comic books. It's all about going back onto a gold standard. It's exactly what it says written in gold on the new $100 bill that the citizens have the right to overthrow their government if they get out of control. If you look at the new $100 bill, the right side, there's gold writing, there's a gold ink. Well, you know, the, the Congress can take care of this Federal Reserve nightmare with the stroke of a pen. And all they have to do is is uh, close down the Federal Reserve. It is unconstitutional for anybody other than Congress to regulate money. That that was never changed. The Federal Reserve Act was brought about in 1913 on December 23rd when most of Congress was gone. Um, Woodrow Wilson is the president who signed it into law. And, and everybody asked me, well, Woodrow Wilson was 
He was an anti-banker, though, wasn't he? I said, yes, he was, absolutely. So what is it that the bankers did to get him to flip? And I believe it has to do with this massive gold find that they found in the Grand Canyon and announced in the front page of the New York Times in June 2012. Billions of ounces of gold were found in the Grand Canyon, um, and it would have destroyed the monetary system. There was only about 100 million ounces at the time floating around as money, and we were on a gold standard back then. Um, so, yeah, it was extremely frightening for Woodrow Wilson to think that the um, the monetary system would be literally destroyed and chaos would have hit all around the world um, had this, this huge gold uh, – mine been opened and, and mined for the gold and it's still an area of the Grand Canyon that is off limits. There's a military base in there. The U.S. Marines are guarding it and nobody is allowed to go in there. And it's one of those big secrets. It's why on the back of the $1 bill, you see the, the pyramid and the all seeing eye and all that. There are pyramids within the Grand Canyon, very ancient pyramids that have been kind of uh, destroyed and, and torn down over the years. Uh, but you're not allowed to go there, and nobody's been allowed to go there since it was turned into a national monument, a national park by Woodrow Wilson back in the 19, you know, 19 I think 1919 is when um, the, the final national park, uh, or, or yeah, it's a national park it's got turned into, which gives uh, federal government complete control of it, and you're not allowed to go there. Uh, and this is this right in the middle of the United States, one of those amazing beautiful areas in the world and all you're allowed to do is stand on this cliff on this little shelf and look at it from you know miles away um and that's that's what happened in the early days and and that's why the federal reserve was given the power to control our money and they have taken that power and control and abused it beyond recognition and uh but that was also the plan is to run the system uh, unbacked fiat system as long and hard as possible soaking up all the benefits along the way and then finally crash the system. And, and I think you're going to see March 15th is the um, the debt ceiling deadline. That's kind of the the gun goes off as far as destroy the currency because they're not going to uh, increase the debt ceiling this time. And, and there's going to be quite a, a brouhaha about that over the next four or five months. So you don't think that uh, Trump and, and Congress, you don't think they're going to make a move on the debt ceiling because Trump wants to um, – uh, he wants to borrow what a trillion for infrastructure spending. So, uh, oh yeah, he wants to spend. He, he's living up to the road to root theory a hundred percent. Spend as much as you can to destroy the dollar, and that's. I mean, Trump knows exactly what's going on 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 the uh, on the gold manipulation side, on the silver manipulation side, on you know the guy he hired as his treasury sec, treasury secretary is a computer programming market rigger from Goldman Sachs. That was his job at Goldman Sachs. He was head of IT. Steve Mnuchin is a computer market rigger. He's a bad guy in my book, and I think he'll be the first one fired when the system starts going sideways. And now that we have all these codes, at, at least in, in, in WikiLeaks, I'm sorry for jumping around, but WikiLeaks says this is just 1% of what they're going to release, this, this latest release. And it was all the codes for the embedded um, spyware in all our electronics. Just wait till we get to releasing all the codes for computer market rigging and computer market manipulation. Then you're going to see real chaos in the markets because that's how the unbacked system is controlled through computers and derivatives invented by Alan Greenspan and this guy Stephen Duvaux back in the 60s and 70s. And Stephen Duvaux was U.S. military intelligence, went to the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and ran the computer market rigging programs for them. And then he went to a company called PSDI, and PSDI was owned by IBM and basically put embedded programs into machinery and devices. I mean, if you want one person to blame for all this embedded stuff and the CIA program over the last 30, 40 years, it's Stephen DeVoe, and, and now he's a world-renowned expert on project implementation. You know, what, what's a bigger project to implement than the – then the total control of the monetary system, the the electronics of the world, the machines of the world. It's crazy when you go down this rabbit hole. So you're saying that, I just want to get this straight here, that Trump, his whole mission is to bring down the economy. No, 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 no. I, no? I, I'm saying Trump's mission is to remove the, 
the deep state bad guys that have controlled us for all these years. And it's not Trump's mission. Trump's just the front guy. They tried to get, you know, a guy who was the salt of the earth, Ron Paul. They tried to get him to be the guy to, you know, be the front guy for this return to a true America. And he just was not strong enough. Um, Trump is, is strong. He doesn't care what he says. He's like a bull in a china shop. He's the exact opposite of Ron Paul. Yeah, yeah. But look what happened. Trump was able to stand it, and he's audacious about it, and, and the good guys were able to take down the bad guys behind the scenes. Now, they're absolutely still embedded, and there's all kinds of booby traps that Obama had laid for the Trump administration. He's going through those now one by one. Um, but, but Trump and the good guys have the final, final ace in the hole. And that is to reveal the truth about what goes on and what went on in the past, you know, going down the, the pedophile issues and, and Pizzagate and like really, really intense things that, you know, would shatter the mind frame of the liberal left. And, and, and Trump can show the world how this is all a game. It was all a setup to destroy our country. Like they're destroying Germany right now by opening the borders. Um, I know a lot of Germans who will move into South America because they have lost their country, literally. And over the next few months, next six months to next year, Germany will be a completely different place, completely overrun by different ideologies. And, and the melting pot of Europe is going to be a boiling pot, and the Germans are getting out. I just want to go back a second. Uh, you said that Obama set up like booby traps for Trump. Like, what do you mean by that? Well, one of the things he set up is, <laughs> is who gets to see top secret uh, data. And it used to be very controlled within the NSA, and, and you had to have uh, all this uh, clearance and encryption. And then right like 16 days, I think it was, before Obama left, he made that information available to all the heads of all 16 departments. And so there's basically no way to track leaks because so many people have this top secret information, things like that. And the the obvious uh, spying in everything from our, you know, our, our TV sets to our computers. You know, there's different levels. There's the individuals spying on citizens, which, oh, no, you know, the individuals can get all outraged. That, that's not the big deal. It's it's spying on, you know, Trump and his kids and the people behind Trump. You know, they're on his laptop and they're in his on his iPhone. They can listen and watch everything he does and everything his people do. Every uh, every uh, state head around the world. That's how invasive this this entire program is. It is it is global. You know, the head of China, whenever he goes on his cell phone, is going to be listened to by these people within the CIA. It, it is it is unbelievable what was just released from WikiLeaks and. The more it sinks in that this isn't just an individual privacy issue. This is a global network of spyware that can literally listen into all of uh, Vladimir Putin's conversations and, you know, or, or watch him when he's sleeping and things like that. It's amazing how, how totally encompassing this information is. I guess that's why uh, Russia, China, they were getting rid of computers that were built in America, getting rid of the iPhone, getting rid of Windows operating system, getting rid of all of that, because I guess they figured it out like, okay, they, they're spying on us. Um, yeah. They started yeah. to get rid of all that stuff. Yeah, but it, you know, it's really hard to get rid of. Just look at uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, chauffeur, his personal chauffeur, his favorite driver. Uh, was killed in a car accident, and they have video of it. He's, it's basically on a two-lane highway or a, a, a two-way uh, freeway with like four or five lanes on each side, but uh, no real big median in the middle. And he's driving down the road, and all of a sudden his car turns left into the oncoming traffic. You know, was that him making a mistake, you know, having a heart attack or something, or was it a click of the mouse at the CIA taking out? Uh, Putin's favorite uh, chauffeur as a message. They can do it. This WikiLeaks release says, you know, it's in every automobile, and they can control what's going on in every automobile. It is unbelievable. Our our lives have changed. Our understanding of of what is is happening and what they can do to us. I mean, I look at my car. I go out there. I turn it on. Any electronic wire, any electronic uh, hard drive in there probably has this embedded software in it that can both, you know, listen to what I'm doing uh, or change the uh, the steering mechanism or mess with the brakes, all kinds of stuff. It's a mess. 
and this will never go away. It is embedded in everything. Now, there's people out there trying to, you know, patch it up right now as we speak, but <laughs> the world has changed, and now we know about it, so what are we going to do? We are, we are stuck in this odd, strange reality that, that we're going to have to live in with forever, forever until everything is destroyed and started back up again, you know, kind of like the financial system, until it is completely destroyed and everybody loses everything in the unbacked electronic system. After that, we can move forward. But until that, it's always going to be messed up, always going to be concentrated into the these black pools is where all the, the cash and money is now you know, hoarded away by the likes of J.P. Morgan and the, the banksters and things like that and, and offshore entities. Um, so, yeah, we are – this is the transition. Everything needs to fall apart before we can kind of uh, get back on our feet in, into something that's – livable at least and insane but you know how long will it take to get rid of all these electronics so you said bringing down the economy is the fed then trying to bring it down and to blame it on trump because it looks like they're going to be raising rates into this like this really weak economy and they did this back in 1937 when inflation was rising the economy was very weak and then it you know brought the economy back down i mean are they trying to bring it down well it, it, there's this you got to you got to take the Fed and kind of parse it out and say, okay, there's there's embedded bad guys within the Fed. Not a lot, truthfully. It's probably five or six within the Fed who are, are in charge of, like, the dark side, and, and they, they're not even allowed to talk to other people within the Fed. But there's thousands and thousands of people within the Fed. You know, the question of who controls the Fed, ultimately, it is President Trump. He can he can go to the Fed and, and fire Yellen, and, or more importantly – fire Stanley Fisher, who actually runs the Fed. Stanley Fisher is the ex-Israeli central banker. Why he is our central banker, just because he has double citizenship, dual citizenship, is, is beyond me. But uh, no, no, everything's done out of the Treasury and out of the head of the Fed. But yes, they are trying to destroy the system and one way or another, either crash the system like they tried to do in 2008, and they were maybe we were like 30 minutes away from destroying every electronic asset in the world. Hank Paulson went to Congress and they they worked out a bailout to give him a little time. But since then, the problems have increased in, in huge multiples of what was before. Now we have sovereign debt problems in Europe and banks like Citibank and J.P. Morgan are heavily invested in European derivatives. If, if the European uh, Union, if one country backs out or or back out of the euro, you can kiss J.P. Morgan goodbye, Citibank goodbye, which means every single bank in the United States would go because they're all interconnected, and they all have customers who would lose. You know, if one customer banks or, or somebody works with Bank of America or J.P. Morgan, and that bank goes down, you know, all the money that the, the businesses that held their money in those uh, operations would go down as well and then you'd see every single bank it's everything is connected because they're on a fractional reserve system people will start running to the bank and withdrawing the money and they'll find out very soon within a matter of hours that the money's not there so we talked about uh trump replacing the curtains with gold hanging up andrew jackson gold in the grand canyon and then we have china and russia who have been buying as much gold as they possibly can and china came out saying that they want to include gold in the special drawing rights in the basket of currencies yeah china's well china's winning the game china wants to keep the game going that's why trump's all you know anti-china you know, it's amazing. You see Obama gets in there, and he's very pro-China, anti-Russia, and then the, and Trump gets in there, he's very anti-China, pro-Russia. Um, China wants to keep the game going because they're winning the game. You know, they want to keep the sunback system going, but they're they're prepared. They have a lot of gold, and truthfully, their main focus is going to be Bitcoin. And they've just cleaned up their Bitcoin markets. They've told the three largest exchanges, which is OKCoin. OK BTCC and Huawei that they cannot any longer uh, rehypothecate and uh, fractional reserve their trading, which any market is is all fractionally reserved um, because these are Bitcoin derivatives that are traded in the markets and not actual Bitcoin transactions on the blockchain. So the three largest exchanges in China have basically shut down any withdrawal of Bitcoin. 
you can withdraw money, but you can't withdraw Bitcoin. And the price of Bitcoin rose from, I think it was around $800 when this started to $1,200 now. China has huge plans for Bitcoin because it can, they have a gigantic population that can instantly be wealthy. Every single person in China, if they give, you know, one Bitcoin per town and then allow Bitcoin to be, you know, traded freely and and central banks printing money to buy bitcoin at a million dollars of bitcoin china would be a very well off nation and each town within china could distribute the bitcoin amongst their people it's very easy to do once you learn how to use bitcoin you can you can put a bitcoin on your wallet right now and sign up and get some bitcoin right now this very minute and china knows that and and they can completely uh, kind of circumvent the uh, unbacked fiat system and invent something new for their country. And, and there's been a white paper, supposedly, that Cliff High seen um, in Chinese that uh, was circulated with, like, hundreds of benefits of doing this for the Chinese people. So, yeah, that's China's ultimate plan, I think, is some kind of gold backing but definitely an, an implementation of a Bitcoin currency protocol. So what's going to happen here in the United States? I mean, China's moving towards Bitcoin. We do have Bitcoin here in the United States, but what happens to the dollar? What happens to the reserve status of the dollar? Is that going to go away? Yeah, with the, with the crashing of the banks, the, the dollar is gone. The un well, not the dollar. Remember, the Federal Reserve note is gone. The, the Federal right, Reserve yes. note is not a dollar. Um, the dollar is still defined as you know so many grains of silver. Um, from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston information that I have uncovered, uh, it is clear that they want to go back onto a gold standard and use a lot of this hidden gold within the United States to do that. Um, everybody, you know, from my friends from GATA, keep keep saying that uh, the there is not all that much gold, and gold is you know it, 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 it's so rare and it's just two Olympic sized swimming pools. That amount of gold was invented in the 1960s by a guy named Harry Oppenheimer, who owned GMFS, and they did the seminal report, according to uh, Jeffrey Christian, on on the gold reserves, and it's a complete lie. And you know, Harry Oppenheimer was the owner of the Beers Diamonds, the the cartel of diamonds that they do the same thing with the beer diamonds. Um, but yeah, there's millions of tons of gold available above ground and below ground, and that amount will, you know, everybody says, well, oh my God, you know, the price of gold will crash. No, it won't. There's there's trillions and trillions and quadrillions of electronic fiat Federal Reserve notes out there. So gold will be fine. It won't go up as much in purchasing value as silver will. Um, but gold will be fine. It'll actually be great because it's, because it is so plentiful. I think it will be part of the monetary system going forward in the United States. It's clearly what the Federal Reserve Bank documents are saying. So, yeah, I think I think the United States will uh, will do all right because we have a constitution. We have kind of rules that we can go back to, uh, especially having Congress regulate the, the value of money and what we use as money. Um, I think silver will be too valuable to use as money, um, and Bitcoin will be a great, great tool f to use as money in the United States. And, and as you can tell, um, everybody says, oh, no, they're, they're going to ban Bitcoin because, of, you know, the, the banks don't like it. Well, <laughs> actually, they aren't. You know, name me one law that they've implemented that bans Bitcoin. Um, they're actually supposed to be approving or, or you know, turning down in a Bitcoin ETF. There's three on the, on the table right now to be approved. And if even just one of them is approved, you can see the Bitcoin price rocket. Um, I'm not a fan of the Bitcoin ETFs because it's just another Bitcoin. It's another derivative into their system because you don't actually trade Bitcoin. You can own a share the way ETFs work. You own a share. It's like you don't own, you know, silver in a silver ETF. You own a share, and then it's it's linked somehow. They like to say to <laughs> physical silver. Same thing with the Bitcoin ETF, but it will bring attention to Bitcoin around the world, especially in the United States. It will open up trillions of dollars of potential investment through the uh, electronic system while the electronic system is still going. So yeah, very exciting time for Bitcoin and gold and silver. So when we move uh, to this new gold-backed type of currency? Well, there won't be a gold-backed anything. Okay. That was a problem that was before. It has to be gold redeemable. Okay, so gold that redeemable. there's no backing is necessary because no one's going to trust 
the, our monetary leaders after they lose everything in the collapse of the banks. So, it, and the, the Fed documents show this very clearly, people walking into a bank exchanging physical gold coins for paper dollars so that dollars will be redeemable upon presentation at a bank. Okay, so once this, I mean, before this happens, before we get to that point, in between the transition, I mean, how are they going to... This is where we are right now. Okay, we're, we're in that... Tra I mean, but they haven't really done anything to the dollar yet. I mean, everyone's still living and everyone still has the dollar. Everyone's still using the Federal Reserve note, I should say. But it, oh, I, I think I would disagree with that. I would say they have done something that the dollar has lost 98, 99% of its purchasing value since its introduction. That's all part of the plan. Destroy the dollar, use the dollar as much as possible until it implodes. And, and we're at that point now. No, I, I understand that. Like, it, it, it lost its value. But if I go to my neighbor right now and say, oh, you know, let me see your Federal Reserve notes, I mean, he'll probably say, what are you talking about? But they're still using it. They're still taking their Federal Reserve notes. They're still, you know, buying groceries with it. They're still doing stuff with it. When I say the transition, I mean completely moving away from that Federal Reserve note. Right. So the failure of that note. The, the, the failure of that note. I mean, that's the transition I'm talking about. Like, when that process is happening what what happens during that period of time well obviously chaos obviously the the banks will try to invent something new they're talking about special drawing rights having a, a global world reserve currency uh through the imf that won't go that won't fly they will try um and the moment it happens it almost happened we we're 30 minutes away from it in 2008 had congress done what it should have done and not bailed out the banks then that would be that moment there would be no more electronic or there would be uh, paper bills out there. There's not many paper bills. Most people pay for things with electronic uh, IOUs of, of <laughs> Federal Reserve notes now. But, uh, yeah, it will it will come to Congress. That's exactly like 2008, except on a larger scale. Uh, Steve Mnuchin, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, will go to Congress and say, unless you give us $20 trillion to bail out the banks again, the system will implode and everybody will lose everything. Congress now has the people behind it so angry at these bankers on both sides of the aisle there will be no bailout. So what are the ramifications of no bailout? There is no money. There is no nothing to exchange anything with. And that's when we have to decide how this the, – the, the Fed and the U.S. Treasury have been planning on this for a long, long, long time. Uh, at least since the 1970s is when the, the information from the Fed Boston came out. And um, there will be a lot of ways to go forward. And what will the people choose? And, and Alan Greenspan talks about this a lot in his book on asset allocation. If you need to asset, if you need to allocate assets to your population, what's the best way to do it? Um, his solution was an asset allocation model based not solely, but mainly on the Social Security system give people, allocate money, allocate the new gold back, not back, gold money in uh, proportion to what they have bought into Social Security. That way you reward those who have worked the most, and, and but everybody still gets something who's worked, and then you have a base level of giving out uh, a certain amount to everybody so that society will function uh, better, actually, because remember, when the banks go down and you lose all these electronic assets, all the electronic debt goes away too. And and the big problem with humanity now around the world is way too much debt. So it will be a, a debt jubilee, and we will start fresh. It'll be really exciting. I mean, when, when I'm just thinking to myself when you're saying all this. I mean, all the programs that the government has, uh, like food stamps, welfare, all the credit that you know trucking companies use and and corporations use, and all the pensions and Everything. I mean, I mean, people are going to be completely shocked from this. I mean, I mean, you're telling me that you know when he goes to Congress and asks for twenty trillion, and they say no, we're going to have that. I guess that aha moment. You know, saying whoa, and everything. I mean, you're saying everything's just going to come to a complete screeching halt. Yep, that's exactly it. And and the, the people you mentioned, you know, the people on welfare and all that. They'll be better off than the people who have been, you know, <laughs> mollycoddled their whole lives and and. You know, we, we've been in such a nanny state and the rich people will be, they'll be the worst off because they're, they won't know how to survive off, off nothing. <laughs> the, the people on welfare, it's not that big a, of a, of a jump. But the people who are rich and wealthy and, and living the high life, 
uh, we'll have no more money and it's down to, okay, you know, what do we do going forward? They won't have the power and pull anymore either because everybody will hate these rich people who screwed up our lives. Um, so we'll get down to, you know, we the people, what do we choose going forward? And, and most likely those in power now will not be the ones making the decision because when this happens, it will also be exposed of their abuse of their power in the past. They're saying at least one third of Congress will be taken out just for the pedophile stuff. And that's a big chunk of our, our nation, nation's leadership. But that's what we need. We need a federal government that is not, you know, 35 million people um, working directly or indirectly for the federal government. That was never the intention. It was supposed to be, you know, state rule and the federal government's powers are supposed to be limited. That will all go away. And, yeah, it's, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy. But would you rather have living, you know, would you rather live in a nanny state that moves towards, you know, socialism and then communism and then crashes and then goes back to capitalism? It, you know, the cycle is running, and we're right at that point where they were trying to implement socialism. And um, we all know that doesn't work, and it turns into communism. And then when communism fails, it goes back to chaos. And, and I think the, the Trump people and the people uh, working behind the scenes to take out these bad guys – uh, don't want to go through that chaos, don't want to delay this this situation any further. They've delayed it long enough. They've been delaying it since the introduction of computer market manipulation in the 1960s and 70s. So, yeah, it's, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun, and millions of people will die. And that's the problem with um, the system and, and how we go from what we have had for the last 100 years to something new. Nobody's aff Everybody's afraid to press that red button to make it happen. Um, but everybody knows that things are getting worse, worse, and worse. So who's going to press the red button? And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It was pressed in 2008, and then we unpressed it with the bailout of the banks. Do you think that there is uh, support for another bailout in Congress of the banks? And I would say 100% hands down no, no matter what the consequences People will not bail out the banks again. So, I mean, the debt ceiling, the whole thing comes uh, comes up March fifteenth, and uh, but that's not that's not really a deadline. That's, no, it's it's just it's just uh, yeah, I know it, it's it's that's when the the Treasury Secretary has to shuffle things around, right? But but really importantly, the Treasury Secretary has to use money from the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which is like the kitty of where they rig the markets. So once they start using that money, and, and let's say they don't raise the debt ceiling. Now, many people think they're going to raise the debt ceiling and things are just going to go you know, as normal as they were before. Now, let's say they don't raise the debt ceiling and they start using the stabilization fund that they use to rig the markets. So the markets will no longer be rigged. So no, 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 no. They're rigged. They're rigged. No, I mean, but if they're if they're shifting those funds to keep the government operational, well, that's one level on on a very kind of you know everybody can see that level. The reality of market rigging, it's done with computers and derivatives, which does not take money. It does not take funds. It takes electronic uh, IOUs. That's why that market is in the hundreds of quadrillions of dollars is because it does not take money to rig the markets. It takes a computer in the basement of the U.S. Treasury, and it takes the, the buy-in from the regulators, which they have. The uh, working group on financial markets consists of the head of the Fed, the head of the U.S. Treasury, the head of the SEC, and the head of the CFTC. They're the ones who decide whether or not the market rigging continues, as it has done since the 1960s, or if it ends. And clearly, the East is kicking our butts, knowing what what they they know about the market rigging, they know about the manipulation. So that's why China wants the system to go forward because they are winning the battle. When it is not in the best interest of the United States to continue this game. We'll pull the plug, and that's where we are now. I think David Stockman said that we only have, what, like um, up until like the summer or the beginning of the fall to keep the system going with the money that the government has on hand. But that assumes that people are going to pay their taxes this time around. There is a huge movement to not pay taxes from the left because people hate Trump. And, you know, people not paying their taxes on an individual basis is a problem for the person. People not paying their taxes on a on a countrywide basis in large masses is a problem for the government. So without 
taxes coming. I mean, taxes have been declining coming into state and into federal all along. But well, true, is, but but remember, their big chunk comes in every time on April fifteenth. Right. So if you don't get what they expect, you know, this running out uh, if they don't raise the debt ceiling, this running out of money in the summer is based on the assumptions that the normal tax revenue is going to come in in April. And there is a movement. It'll get bigger and bigger as we get closer to April 15th of people not deciding not to pay their taxes. And if you get enough people who decide not to pay their taxes, there's no way the government could go around, you know, and, and audit and arrest millions of Americans. Um, what will happen is, and the government will run out of money, you know, according to the law. And, uh, yeah, that it's a great way to end the game is just, get a, a mass of people not to pay taxes. So you think from, from what you're saying here that we have until what, like the summer, the beginning of fall. And then that's when it, I think that's, I think that's too late. I think I think you're going to see the chaos start around March 15th chaos. Like monetarily, I, I think the fed's going to be buying stocks as they usually do. And stock market could rise artificially, but, uh, I mean, that's been going on since <laughs> since the 70s. And I, I think we're going to have the kind of the – if Europe goes, everybody goes also. And Europe is on their knees from Greece to Spain to Italy. The Italian banks are a mess. Um, so, yeah, in, any one of these could trigger the implosion of this this Ponzi scheme.